We don't need super intelligent AI for work to get disrupted. We have a general purpose technology, the first in a generation. Nothing has been adopted this quickly. Nothing has been quite this alien. Nothing has been this out of control. It's going to take a decade or more to just absorb the impact, even without a single day more advanced technology. And more advanced technology is probably coming. I anticipate that uh, tools of AI will, in fact, be used for ill. We are very much wanting to have a constructive and practical conversation. So I think the message I want to get across is agency. This is not something being done to us. We get to make decisions about what this is, and we should actively make those decisions. We shouldn't passively sit back. The only way to prepare for the future is to embrace it. There is a lot of opportunity now to access resources you couldn't access before. No one's guaranteeing you success, but there's never been a better time to do that. This is a great time to kind of shake off the, the spores of habit and look around and say, what do I want to do differently? Well, hello, everybody. It's Jim O'Shaughnessy with yet another Infinite Loops. My guest today is someone who I absolutely love the work he is doing. He is Ethan Mullick, the Associate Professor at the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. He is in charge of researching innovation and entrepreneurship, all things that I love. He also leads the Wharton Interactive uh, System to Democratize Education Using Games, Simulations, and AI. And wait, there's more. You're also the author of several books. Uh, you took your BA from Harvard and your PhD and MBA from the Sloan School of Management at MIT, and you co-founded a startup. I mean, I don't even know where to begin. Welcome, Ethan. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. So I love your work primarily because you were one of the first to come out saying, you know what? I started as an AI skeptic, and after I saw it, I just thought, oh my God, this is, this is going to change everything. Um, can you tell us, a, can you give us the origin story um, uh, of, of how that happened? And, uh, and uh, Sure, I've been AI adjacent for a very long time. So I was, I was at MIT, I worked, did work with the Media Lab um, and with, um, with Marvin Minsky's AI group there. Um, so I, I've hung out around the AI people, but I'm not a computer scientist. Um, but I've been spending a lot of time trying to think about how we democratize access to education. So I've been building games to do that. I've been using all the latest tools. Um, and when GPT-3 came out and sort of these large language models, the initial early ones, I had my students play with them to sort of see what the future looked like and had them cheat with GPT-3. Um, and we are kind of in the middle of that assignment when chat came out. And it was a pretty fast transition because it was like, you know, I knew what the other systems did, and there was such a huge leap in quality between GPT-3 and GPT-3.5 that was immediately apparent. By, by the next class I taught on Tuesday, like four days later, I introduced it to the class that day just with my own experiments, right? There's no book or anything else. By the end of the class, one of my students, and this is an entrepreneurship class for undergrads, had demoed a, had created the demo for their product using code, using libraries they never used before. I posted on Twitter that night, two VC scouts contacted him by the next day. Um, by two days later, 60% of my students had used chat for various reasons in their class. So like, it was immediately apparent as somebody who thinks about sort of entrepreneurship or teaching, they're like, we hit something that was kind of light, lightning here. Um, and then not everyone knew about that uh, early on. I think people started to know now, but they didn't early on. Yeah. I, one of the things you've said uh, that really resonates with me is the only way to prepare for the future is to embrace it. And I love to see you doing that in, in your class. Um, and one of the other things that you've said that I'd like you to come in a little bit more on is even if AI stops making any progress from this point forward, it's still going to account for massive changes. Talk a little bit about that. So I think when we think about uh, AI and where we are in the future, people tend to think about either things staying static, which I think is impressive enough, we'll talk about that, or they tend to think about sort of this third case of AI becomes exponentially better every day. And um, then we have, you know, artificial general intelligence and we all get murdered perhaps, right? This extinction event. And I think that's worth worrying about, right? Obviously, right? But it's also a distraction for what I think the most likely case is for AI, which is it keeps getting better where it is now, right? We don't need 
super intelligent AI for work to get disrupted. We don't need super intelligent AI for entrepreneurship to get disrupted. Like the tools we have now are so profoundly transformative, it's going to take a decade or more to just absorb the impact, even without a single day more advanced technology. And more advanced technology is probably coming. Yeah. And you touched on something there that is like near and dear to my heart, uh, which is the the goalposts have been set so wide, I think, in my opinion. On the one hand, we have the the people writing like what when I first saw like Yudowski's thing in time, um, you know, calling for the bombing of GPU plants, I thought, okay, so wow. But then there's also the other side, right? Which is like, oh, AGI, we're going to have that next month. And I think that both of those, those polar opposites are the least likely possibilities. I agree with you that we absolutely have to have a discussion about this powerful new technology because it, it really is powerful, but it's a, it's a tool and tools can be used for good or ill. Um, I anticipate that uh, the tools of AI will, in fact, be used for ill. So those of us involved in in the industry, I'm uh, an investor in and chairman of Stability AI, which is an open source AI company. Um, and, and we are uh, very much wanting to have a constructive and practical conversation uh, with, with every which which everyone we hopefully will be able to take part in. We're thinking of like a moderated wiki, for example. Um, and so I very much uh, uh, yeah, am in favor of that. What do you think about people staking out like these really kind of extreme claims on both sides? I'm not just talking about the, the doomers. I'm talking about the, you know, AI utopias too. So, I mean, look, I... I... I've been AI for a while, you know, AI related for a while, including, you know, Marminsky, frustrated person, one of the founding fathers of the field. I've worked with lots of the kind of, you know, key AI people. And, you know, it, it, it is very clear that, like, you know, don't, like, dude, this is unexpected that we're getting this kind of game, right? So certainly I used to listen to people like Ray Kurzweil and be like, oh, this seems a little over the top given what I know. Certainly my priors have changed as of November, right? It no longer seems impossible that we get a AGI, but I have no insight about whether that's possible or not. And I do worry about, I mean, and absolutely when I talk to people in the government, I say, look, I want you to have a plan for what happens if this is the case. I think we absolutely need to be worried about this. I think we should think about regulation, but I also worry that ends up being a distraction, both the doomer and the, you know, and the optimist view from what is about to happen. We have a general purpose technology, the first in a generation more than that, like, you know, the computers were a general purpose technology. Maybe the internet was a general purpose technology. Uh, then we're talking about electrification, steam, but nothing has been adopted this quickly. Nothing has been quite this alien. Nothing has been this out of control of organizations and companies and in the hands of individuals before. It's going to touch everything we do. And as you said, it weighs good and ill. If, if, and, you know, so I think we need to worry about this future. And I'm really glad there's people worrying about this, writing letters and AI emphasis. I don't, I'm not an expert in that. I don't have that much to add to that debate other than I'm glad. We should be concerned. But even if there's a complete halt tomorrow to building AI, I don't think anyone thinks GPT-4 is what they're thinking of halting, right? Or like that's some future AI. And the truth is, unless we went backwards, you know, six months or a year, we're already in for disruption. And it's going to be different in every field. And, you know, is it everything from, you know, to fundamentally changing jobs to fundamentally changing the kind of information we can trust? Uh, there's a lot of a lot of change, right? General purpose technologies touch everything. And there's no outside expert who could tell you how it's going to affect your industry at this stage. You have to work, you know, it's, there's nobody that could turn to it. I think that also is baffling to people. They sort of think like there's an instruction manual. There's not an instruction manual. You can't go, OpenAI doesn't have document. The documentation is that their API is documented, kind of. There's no other piece there, right? Nobody can tell you what stability is going to be used for, right? What's stable to be like, we're talking about uses all the time. Like, you know, I, nobody knows the answer because it's general purpose technology. So I think that we have to kind of grapple with that piece much more urgently than we are. Yeah, I, I I agree. And so I support, for example, one thing that we're trying to put together at Stability AI would be a, a big prize for a deep fake hackathon uh, where the winning software would uh, identify deep fakes at least in existence then, but as you for know, the, for the next for the next month, right? <laughs> exactly, because the the generative adversarial uh, AIs will go back and forth. Once that's out, they'll start, uh, you know, gaming it. 
But I think that just showing the intentionality and and continually updating that that software and and our goal of course would be if we do come up with something that works at least for the prior cases right we don't have any illusions um but that would at least be something that we would give away for free um yeah. we would make sure that everybody could download it etc and then we would work on keeping that updated but to sort of shift gears You've also pointed out that, you know, the, there's going to be an explosion of minimally viable products, right? With experimentation available using AI, very cheap, very easy. And, and tell me a bit about some of the use cases that you've seen from your classroom and, and others that if you're like, wow, I never thought about that. I mean, so I am seeing use cases everywhere. I mean, certainly it's a use as a tool to help you do stuff, right? So you can interview the AI and it gives you reasonably good answers as a starting place for good customer interviews, right? It actually answers survey questions accurately according to some of the most recent research that came out. Like there's a whole bunch of tool uses. Like my students now, I used to have them for their assignment, right? For, you know, and we have a very successful class at Wharton. I teach it along with other professors. I'd love to give myself full credit for it, but it's it's a good course with incredible students taught by many people. Uh, but, you know, people have raised probably 2 billion VC out of that class, right? And, you know, Ori Parker came out of that class. Adabob, which is developed by Google, came out of that class. Burrow came out. Like, there's a lot of startups that come out of that class. But, you know, it was a reasonably, you know, you have put together an outline. At the end, you'd have a pitch deck. Now I'm requiring students to do, like, infinitely more work. I actually tell, tell them they have to do at least one impossible thing, thanks to AI. So if they can't code, I need working software. If they don't know how to do design work, I need a website that's fully operational. Every one of the projects they turn in has their criticism by at least four famous entrepreneurs um, that they have to invoke and have them criticize their business plan piece. So I think one piece is that like co-founder side note kind of piece is a huge deal, right? Helps you overcome inertia and deal with them. And then on the idea generation, you know, we have this interesting problem, which is AI is pretty lousy software right now. Like it doesn't work well with software. It doesn't do things software does. You get like, I'm building a bunch of simulation software using AI and it is just wild because sometimes it refuses to answer. Sometimes it gets mad at you. Sometimes it gets offended. Sometimes it's really insightful. Sometimes it isn't. You're like that is not how software works, right? Software doesn't sometimes insult your customers and then sometimes solve their tax problems. AI could do that. So thinking about like software is a problem too. It, it's best to almost think about like people. It's not a person, but think of it as a person, somebody you bring in. So I'm less, I mean, I'm seeing lots of startup ideas around AI. I wonder if any of them are going to matter because it's ultimately going to be a prompt that you're going to give one of the foundational models or what, you know, and, and make things happen that way. So I'm viewing the people side as more important than the, and that's that's what's really enabling, right? And also, by the way, now your competition just increased. Everybody in, you know, in, um, you know, uh, in, Pick a, you know, pick a state, you know, Congo or whatever is now speaking um, fluent, full English, um, you know, American English can code. Like there's 169 countries have access to Bing, or GPT-4. You can't get a better model outside of being inside one of the companies that's building these things. That's insane. Yeah. And you had a great quote, which I loved, which is kind of think about a a AI as uh, this like infinitely talented uh, uh, graduate student who likes to lie sometimes, <laughs> but really wants to keep you happy. I thought that was such a great quote because it's really true. Um, it's not, and you, you had another observation that I'd like you to, to elaborate on a little bit. A AI is not a search bot, right? It, don't use it at, to search. Use it as a generative tool. Use it for a variety of reasons. But if you think you're going to like, go to chat uh, GPT or GPT-4 and say, you know, uh, you know, what's the capital of fill in the blank? It'll give it to you, but that's the wrong way to use it, right? Yeah, and, and I think the chatbot sort of breaks the model a bit, which is quite interesting. I just got access to Google's, um, you know, generative tool that lets you create documents that's coming to Office and everything else too. And you can just see the difference. Who is going to start from a blank page anymore and write down... You know, they're like, they're not going to do that. People are going to instead be, you know, start with a request to the AI to make something happen. That's going to change how all kinds of communications happen, right? So I think this idea that you're, you you know, moving away from the search engine piece, it's bad. It's, 
AI demos very badly because the three things or four things people do is the first thing they do is do a search. It doesn't do a good search. Or maybe it lies. The second thing they do is they almost always ask it a personality-based question of the future of AI. What do you think the future of AI is going to be? And if there's one thing that every AI company has thought about is how do I put that on enough guardrails so it just answers as blandly as possible that humans are also very important. And like it's not, a, it's so it's, you're bored out of your mind, right? Then you might ask it for, you know, a poem and you're like, this is kind of neat. And most people end up poetry. And then sometimes you ask it, tell me about myself and it lies to you about things. And you're like, this is stupid. And you walk away, right? So people walk away all the time or else they actually do start to engage with it. And then they encounter the inevitable existential terror that comes from realizing this thing is real. And then you put it down. I've talked to a lot of really smart people who've been like, it's just starting to freak me out. So I walked away. So it's a really hard system because you have to both be avoid being, you know, being falling into existential angst, but also get past that initial, it's hostile to use kind of experience to get to see what's in the middle. Yeah. And I, that is so true. And I remember the first time I was playing around with uh, the earlier models of AI. And I'm like, hmm, I, I, this is, this, this just is really interesting, but it doesn't seem to work the way I think it should work. I think that we'll probably end up spending a lot of time on, uh, as people develop uh, uh, more stable systems, more stable use cases, that that will, you know, as you have said, it, it gives us a larger context window into human knowledge, which is one of the things that really excites me the most. Um, I, I, uh, follow Brian Romelli, who's doing these incredible long prompts. I don't know whether you know his work. Yeah, I've seen uh, I've, yeah, it. Really yeah. 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 And, and you've done a lot of work on it as well. Um, do you think that that's kind of a temporary situation? Do you think that the large oh, language model? Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, prompt, prompt crafting is, I, I keep getting calls from people like, teach me prompt crafting. I'm like, you know, it feels like a, it's like almost an old school lesson. Just use it. That's 80% of the way there. I mean, look, there's prompting techniques that could do stuff, but also they're inconsistent, right? We are, you know, um, I work with my wife who is a doctor in education. We both do, you know, a lot of our papers together. She's very good at creating these educational prompts that are general purpose, but they still don't always work, right? And the model updates sometimes. And you can do these very elaborate models. And there's, there are techniques, right? You can do chain of thought prompting and multi-step prompting. But you have to embrace the fact that this is weird. It's like working with a person. So you give them a very large instruction set. Sometimes they'll remember the whole thing. Sometimes they won't. Sometimes they'll be led astray. It's very hard to use like that as a technique. And the truth is, is that hey, OpenAI has mentioned this, and I've seen the same thing, by the way, with mid-journey and, you know, and increasingly, I'm sure, with stability as well. But like, it isn't that hard anymore. It used to be to get a good image out of mid-journey. I had to write a paragraph, you know, micro lens. Far out range, you know, throw it random words, 8K, HD, our photo art station. Like it was a magic spell. And now I'm like, show me a picture of, you know, of, uh, an otter on an airplane. And it just does it, right? And it's the same way with GPT-4. Like, I want to write a book. Okay, help. tell me how I should be getting help from you to do that. And it starts doing it. So prop to crap thing is a very temporary stage of affairs. To the extent that it ends up mattering, it's going to be... You know, as we start to discover fundamentally how to do better prompts, those will be built into the systems ultimately, and not ultimately, like in the short term. So I think this idea that prompt oh, crafting is the next thing and you should pay millions of dollars for, you know, or a hundred thousand dollars for someone to do, you know, to give you prop crafting or, you know, half a million prop crafting exercises, you know, for a, someone to hire, that feels weird to me. There's obviously a set of skills in working with the AI and kind of whispering to it right now, but it's not prompt crafting. It's honestly 10 hours of use. Like that's my, my threshold I tell people. Use it for 10 hours. You'll figure it out. Yeah, I agree. And uh, experimentation uh, with it seems to be the, the best way to get the best results. Uh, we, you and I, I think, are aligned on the idea that I, I personally think that the Senator model uh, that was introduced by Gary Kasparov when he lost to Deep Blue, uh, and then he decided, well, why don't we put together a team uh, of humans plus AI uh, I I certainly think that that's kind of at least for the foreseeable future. Let's say next five months. <laughs> I, I, I think you're. I think I. I mean, I think you're both talking about exactly the right thing and exactly the worry, right? Which is like, if I mean, in some ways, if AI stopped development right now, we'd kind of be okay because it's sort of in the 50th to 90th percentile on most tasks. So 
everybody certainly has at least some set of skills that they're better than the AI at, right? And it definitely needs direction. And there's all kinds of issues, right? So in this time, there's no doubt. And by the way, when you use AI more, like you're saying experimentation, when I write using AI, I am never having the AI write entire paragraphs. What I'm doing is, and that sentence I get stuck on, I'm like, give me 20 versions of this. I'm like, I can't quite make this work, make this better. I want to throw in stuff about this scientific article. Can you just summarize it? And then I'll work from that piece. It's all my voice, right? But I'm using the AI sort of collectively to do work. And some things you delegate more to the AI, right? It's like, write this, you know, grant form, which is like, ugh, you know, just finish this thing. No one's going to read it uh, and do this material. So I think that that centaur model is clearly the key in the short term. That makes AI incredibly idiosyncratic and incredibly individual, though, right? It means that like, my version of AI is different than someone else's. It's tied to the person. And I think you're also right to be kind of worried, like, okay, this is the five-month model, Right. And, you know, hopefully, if we're, you know, what happens with GPT 4.5? What happens to GPT 5? What happens if these models get better fine tuned? I think those are bigger questions. Yeah, I agree. And I, I think one of the uh, other things that you highlight often in your work is something that I have found. And, and that is, I look at it kind of as a co creator, as a collaborator. Um, and, and the idea of, I'm writing something and I get stuck, right? And I love your idea. Just give me, give me 20 or 30 sentences here and then you find one that, that works for you. I personally think the use case of like having, having multimodal AI and for example, feeding your favorite universes into it. So I, I'm a big Tolkien fan and so I feed in Lord of the Rings and I love Dune and I feed that in. And then I ask the AI, I don't want, a universe or a world built in the style of Tolkien or Dune or whatever, but I want you to find all the way they agree, find all the way that they disagree, and then kind of give me a new world that I can iterate off of. Do you, do you see that as like one of the use cases? Yeah, I mean, I think creativity in general is kind of underrated. And by the way, I mean, what AI is is a connection machine. And the people I know who are the scariest users of the system, and I know a few people like this, don't even bother dropping it back into a real world, right? So what they would say is compare the vector space of Tolkien to the vector space of Arrakis, and then find three points of agreement, four, three points of disagreement, then let's manipulate those, then finally tell me what this means in, in human token language rather than in... Uh, you know, in, in, and so people are doing this pattern searching with all sorts of things. So I think that there is this sort of secondary model, but I absolutely agree with you. I think part of this is about connections between things, creativity, spinning off ideas. I mean, one of my favorite little demos is pick a random patent number, a, you know, a, um, like a, a favorite food and a obscure, you know, sociological theory from the 1800s and ask the AI find business ideas based on all three. And it does a pretty good job of that. I love that. I'm going to steal that from you. So thank you. <laughs> no I, haven't done that. I, I, I haven't done that one yet. Um, one of the other things that I think th that I'm really excited about and that you are obviously putting into practice already, and that's this idea of the, the AI and education revolution. Um, I, I really resonate with your message, which is, hey, one-to-one -one tutoring is going to be great. Um, we're going to be able to upscale a lot of people, but that does not mean that the classroom environment is going to be replaced. I think rather that it means that it's going to be wonderfully augmented and that you and brilliant people like you are going to be able to use it to create a different dynamic in the uh, classroom where it's collaborative, where it's you're synthesizing knowledge. How how have your students been responding? Because you're like you're on the front lines there. I mean, you know, I'd love to give myself a lot of credit. I mean, people are just interested in using the AI. They feel empowered, right? Getting huge teaching scores, everything. But I, I think that you're right also just about the model. Like education was the first model threatened by AI, right? Because we, I mean, look, we rely on essays for lots of things, just to pick the most simple example, right? Essays are a chance for people to think, to demonstrate their knowledge, to integrate knowledge. Was it great at all these things? No, but it was good at these things. And it, AI just completely slashed the heart out of essays, right? And in, in, in a lot of different ways. I mean, obviously cheating is one way, but that was always happening. But also, you know, what does it mean to collaborate with the AI? What, where, you know, how are we, what are we smarter and dumber about? All those questions become really real. 
But education will also adapt because there is a need for classroom. You know, there is need for application. Even the best one-on-one tutors, there's always this dream that one-on-one tutor will replace everything. It won't. AI is still going to kind of mess it up. So, but it does let us do something we knew for a long time matters. And we teach in entrepreneurship classes all the time anyway, which is the idea of the flipped classroom, right? The idea that we are um, that we are going to do the boring lecture-based stuff outside of class and in class is all about applications. And the evidence shows that this is better if the in-class materials is, is highly a- active and if the out of the active learning if the outside of class material is high quality. I, those were both problems before. High quality outside of class material, you watch a video of me talking or something. That's not great. But interacting with, you know, com, you know, Comingo or any of these other, you know, AI tutors, you start to realize really quickly, oh, this is actually really powerful. Um, and this has potential to be that sort of loom to sigma tutor, but you still want to apply stuff in cloud. So AI can actually help you come up with in-class exercises and activities to do with students to apply knowledge. So I think classrooms will change. I think it's going to be like, and of course, there'll still be English composition where you're going to be expected to in-class use a computer not connected to the internet, learn how to write. Like we solved this problem in math. It's not going to break everything, right? I have a bigger question of what we're training people for uh, post AI, but I'm not that worried that classes will not get better uh, and adjust as a result. Yeah, I, I, I'm 63, so I came of age when calculators were a big deal. And like, I, I wanted a calculator more than anything. So I had a, like, a, my, I think it was my 12th birthday or whatever. And my parents were like, what do you want? And I was like, I really want, this is 1972. I really want a calculator. And I remember my mom and dad actually talked to my teachers at, in grade school. And they're like, oh, we don't know. We don't, I mean, that, that's cheating, right? And, and so I think that you're bang on with your observation that, that this is a, that's a great example, right? Where that didn't stop people. <laughs> In fact, it did the opposite. It, it freed them uh, for being able to better understand math in many cases. Uh, and, and I see kind of AI doing the same thing. You've written extensively about this. So let me ask you to kind of play futurist for a minute and, and say, like, and, and I won't put a time horizon on it because we'll be woefully wrong. <laughs> but like, what is, what is a kind of fully enabled classroom with the AI look like to you? So, I mean, I, I think that first of all, it's going to vary depending on location. I think AI is going to work a lot like sort of cell phones did, right? So there are all these countries throughout the world that couldn't invest in landline phones and it was causing a huge problem. But then cell phone service came along and then, you know, Kenya and the Philippines all have better cell have better cell phone service than the US for a very long time, right? And leapfrogged an entire generation of technology. So I think in much of the world, we're going to see a real transformation of teaching where teaching is not high quality right now and we're going to see a leap into another model. But in, in the US, in Europe, um, probably in China, other, you know, Japan, other places with, with uh, that already have fairly highly developed educational systems, uh, I think the future looks like one where um, you are going to still go to school as you did before during the same class period times, but you're going to be basically the sort of easiest version to think about is you're going to be doing a much more engaging version of a homework in school, uh, project-based learning, experiences, building stuff, trying to create things, trying to apply things. And outside of school, you're going, your homework assignments are going to be monitored by AI and you'll be working with an AI tutor that will generate lessons for you and teach you concepts and make sure you're on track. It will let the teacher know the person struggling at this despite this and will help the teacher set up teams so that you don't have those horrible team assignments and track grades. So I, I think that there's a model that we already know works. Like we still give lectures. It's like 5,000 years old giving lectures and we know they don't work but we keep doing that, right? So it's going to force us to shake ourselves out of a bunch of stuff that doesn't work well. And I'm sure there'll still be some classes that look like classes, right? I think English composition will still look like English composition. I think math is still going to look a lot like math. But I think a lot of your other projects will be more. And I also think there's going to be more disparity in, you know, possibly more individualness in how we get, you know, graded in advance, right? So if you're good at something, AI will not arbitrarily stop you. This is going to be an issue of work too, right? Like we have a whole bunch of systems designed to keep people in sync. What happens if you don't have to be sick anymore? So, you know, your kid is amazing at history and they go deeper than anyone else. Are they going to be getting the same? You know, you have a possibility that they're being dynamically assigned to work with groups that are not all in the same grade level or the same school. So that's that difference between, you know, finding people's giftedness and being able to let them run as far as they want with it rather than arbitrarily 
you need to wait for the lecture is a really exciting option too. So I think it's how much we embrace this is going to matter. And I think we're going to see a lot of differences appear pretty quickly. Yeah. And another point you make that I uh, agree with entirely uh, is that, you know, the my great excitement about AI is the ability to unlock creativity. Um, and uh, I know that you've written about that a lot. In fact, you you mentioned something uh, in one of your pieces that really struck me. And it was like a third of Americans had ideas for startups, right? And, and they just didn't do anything with it because they didn't kind of know where to start. Do you see the uh, startup activity, et cetera, accelerating because oh, of AI? Absolutely. I mean, one of the things I'm most excited about is, I mean, there's a couple of things here. One is, you know, um, opportunity is much less evenly distributed across the world than talent, right? And we need to look no further than, you know, venture capital as an example, right? So, um, you know, my city of Philly uh, has raised more money last year in VC than all of Japan did, right? Penn grads, grads from the University of Pennsylvania, raised more money last year than everybody in France and Germany put together. And as talented as my students are and our alumni are, and they are, and um, they... I think those two nations have a pretty good track record of coming up with innovations, right? So that's just an example of, you know, and similarly, little bits of entrepreneurship education make a big difference. Even a three-week course in a control study in Uganda found huge effects on, you know, on uh, individual long-term outcomes by just learning entrepreneurship a little bit. So there's a, there's sort of an education and opportunity, but there's also this ability to have a co-founder, right? So people get stuck all kinds of places along the way. And, you know, I have some research suggesting that co-founders actually don't help companies survive well because you don't have any fights with your co-founder. The reason why people always push for co-founders is you have a partner there who's all in with you, who could support you, who could fill gaps that you don't have, who keeps pushing you forward. I wonder how much AI could fill some of those roles, right? Like, I don't want to write this letter, write this letter for me, you know, to handle like the stuff that people, little things hold people back all the time, right? I don't even know how to start, you know, doing market research. AI, how do I do market research? I've assessed a lot of that from an entrepreneurship perspective, former entrepreneur myself kind of perspective. And like, would I say it's as great as the best advice we give at top classrooms? No. Would I say it's better than anything you could probably read in a book and 80% of the way there and 90% of the way there? Definitely. If you follow that advice, it would help you on the right path. So I do think as an enabler for lowering friction for innovation, it's huge. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and to come back to your point about the leapfrogging, you know, I use that example about the U.S. having a great landline telephone system, which is why everyone leapfrogged us in, in cell, cellular technology. And, and we're already starting to see um, some, like, for example, Japan's most recent announcement about copyright. And the, the that at least in Japan, uh, you're going to be able to train AI and and not go foul of copyrights. Do you see kind of this jockeying for position at the kind of nation state level? Do, do you think we're going to see a lot more of that? And are we going to see like emerging economies say, "Hell yeah, we, we're going to go all in on AI"? I mean, so. I think, so there's there's like, that's a really complex question, right? Because there's a whole bunch of dynamics. Like on one dynamic, like it is definitely a competitive booster. So if you can figure out how to use AI in your organization, in, you know, in wherever you are in the world, you're just gaining a competitive advantage. And I keep trying to tell CEOs of U.S. companies, like you're, this, this did a lot to competition. The systems that were great to get you here aren't as useful anymore in preventing competition, right? Your startup competition is now much more widespread. We were depending on language barriers, coding barriers, knowledge barriers as things that were stopping people. Those won't have the same effects, right? So I do think nations will start to embrace this, for, but it's a general purpose technology. Embrace it for what? So things you could obviously do is streamline some aspects of, you know, permitting and other and talk to people thinking about those issues. You can obviously do things where you are going to approach, um, you know, you're going to think about using this to streamline company operations, to increase coding speed, education we talked about. So I, th I think we're going to see some of that. I, you know, I think that there's a broader worry about AI jockeying too, which is nobody thought large language models were going to be that interesting until November when ChatGPT came out, right? And I think even OpenAI was kind of taken by surprise. And, you know, and I've been playing with you know, a lot of the the sort of uh, AI image tools, they were very cool, but still kind of primitive, right? It was, it was the last six months have really seen things change dramatically. So if there aren't at least a dozen nation states that are spinning up their own on guardrails large language models right now or natural large language models, I'd be shocked, right? So the world's about to change again in the next few months as those things start to come online either secretly or not. Um, and so that natural competition is not always going to be benign. 
Yeah. And, and that's the challenge, right? Because uh, that's underlined. It's not always going to be benign. And so, um, you know, I, I have thought, you know, just you mentioning that just UPenn graduates, I mean, that is an astounding statistic that they were able to raise more than countries. And like, it seems to me that one of our advantages here, rule of law, obviously, uh, freedom of speech, et cetera. Do you see like as AI takes um, a more important role in emerging economies, do you see that like maybe affecting the idea that they, wow, we really do need a rule of law. We really do need this or, or no. And is that a bridge too far? I don't know. I mean, I, I think that the, you know, the destabilization dangers are so great that I don't know which, which way things are going to push. Right. Like, I mean, yeah, you know, I keep trying to tell people and I occasionally have these fun posts where I try and, you know, show fake images. Like we shouldn't believe anything we see online anymore. Like this is, it's, it's, you know, and I appreciate what stability is trying to do with Garbo, but like, it doesn't matter. It's whether it's, it's clear that you don't need a giant team for good image generation, right? Because that, as opposed to a foundational model, which costs you a billion dollars, there are twenty percent teams coming up with really good stuff, right? Um, and you know, and like you know, I put my own voice, I put my own image, like, and this is well within the capability of a small team of people doing stuff. And then we know that large language models can do phishing attacks at scale, right? And they like, so I mean, I think that we're going to have these countervailing factors. I, I mean. I actually think from 100 years from now, history books, assuming we, we make it that long, which I'm very optimistic we will, um, I think the period from like basically 2008 until whenever 2032 will look like one period of transition, right? And starting with the iPhone, internet, and sort of social media release through large light. Like we have, we have not coped with the world we're creating. And I think there's countervailing forces of authoritarianism and liberalism that both swirl around in, in the world we're creating. I don't know where we end up with that. Yeah, um, I as, as a big fan of the rule of law and freedom of speech, I'm I'm hoping. <laughs> I, I am too. I, I mean, I, I think so. I think that just our tools are inadequate to our approach. I mean, I, we absolutely need, you know, rule of law is absolutely necessary, right? You know, as is freedom of speech. But it starts to become a really big question. Like, do AIs have the freedom of speech? Do you have the ability to have, you know, if, if the, the freedom of speech always depends on a marketplace of ideas where ideas are competing with each other, when, you know, when you have high-level manipulation, you know, not that you should reduce the freedom of speech, but then we have to think differently about how we, you know, what, how do we privilege certain kinds of speech over others or what kinds of conversations are out. There's just a lot of open questions and our tools were all really good until about 2008 for these things. Like we had a very clear model for how you built a successful, you know, democratic growing regime. And I think that's an open question now, like manipulation at scale. And I think, you know, maybe the centralized platforms solve it. I mean, look, China's solving its own way. There's a whole nice economics paper about, you know, showing about AI, you know, AI autocracy is very easy. Like these tools become very easy to shift over to government tools. Um, I don't know. I think we're really in for a period of change. Yeah, I, that that is the one constant as good old Heraclitus, the pre-Socratic uh, Greek philosopher. Yeah, but it was slow that. then. You had to <laughs> kind of wait a few hundred years for bronze. Like it was, that was like, that was easy, right? Like, you know, I mean, change, change really, I mean, if you look at, and like, the, we have been in a singularity since like 1890, right? Like that's when everything sort of accelerated. And, you know, we're kind of keeping it up, but I think that the pace just went up faster. And I also think that like, look, even if they're not sentient, AI is an alien entity. It's not, doesn't, it's neither thinks nor does it not think, right? Like our categories don't, like, that's a pretty fundamental challenge. It's both creative and not creative. We both know exactly how it operates and can't understand how it works. That's a pretty new category for a thing that everyone has access to. Yeah. You know? And uh, I, I completely agree in terms of, you know, we've got brand new questions that we hadn't even contemplated. And we don't have the structures yet or, or, or uh, infrastructure, right? Mark, you mentioned marketplace of ideas. We, that's vital. Yeah. And so I, I couldn't agree more in terms of we're facing a bunch of new questions that we, we really are going to have to begin to, to start grappling with. Another thing you've pointed out that I, I really uh, enjoy uh, is this idea that people with a broad knowledge of maybe an arcane field like they they might have huge opportunities at least for now uh with uh interacting and iterating with uh ai give me an example uh of like what you would see as like 
a specialized or arcane field where somebody with deep domain knowledge now uh, with the AI is going to be able to really come up with some really cool stuff. I mean, let's start with the image generation, sort of the space that you're in, right? So, I mean, the AI has absorbed all of this art from all of history. And what do people end up doing? They know, like the same four artists all the time, right? Like do a Monet, do a, like, but if you know about batik painting and you know about, you know, German expressionism and you know about, you know, the 14th century Flemish art schools, you can produce results nobody else sees right? That don't look samey. In the same way, if you're writing essays and you know the style of like, let's do this in the style of, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, John McPhee or whatever, like you're going to get a very different result because it's absorbed everything. And what you're trying to do is move the context that the AI is looking at to the right part of sort of latent space to get a unique answer. And the best way to do that is to know the space that it can explore, know as much human history as possible. Like, for example, you know, like not only does, um, you know, I've tried to get the AI, we talked about Tolkien earlier, and, you know, I've had to translate from Sumerian to one of the Elvish languages. And if you know the various Elvish languages, you get different. And, you know, it has trouble with uh, with speech in Mordor, with black speech, because it says it's not there's not enough written of it, to, but it'll, I'll extrapolate for you as best I can. Um, so, I mean, the more you know about that, the more you can move the window to something interesting. Also, the more expertise you have to be able to call BS when the thing hallucinates. So, you know, there there is expertise really does matter more, at least in the short term. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm, I've collected art for a long time and love art. And uh, when I was playing with Dolly too, um, like people would say, how did, you, how did you do that? Right. And the reason I'm thinking about it is I used German expressionism uh, and, and, you know, in the style of Munch and, and whatnot. And everyone's like, how are you getting all of these results? Right. I mean, just, Why does it not look like, it. exactly. Why does it not look like the 16th? Because again, most people are doing very, and you think about that, and this is where I, I push back, you know, people talk about like the AI producers are sort of the average, you know, of what people would do. And it's sort of true, but sort of not true. Just the, on the default side, right? The average writing is pretty bad. And so there's still a lot of open question. I, I've been posing and never got a fully satisfying answer. There's theories about it, about like, why is AI writing so good when the average of writing on the internet that it read is pretty lousy, right? And so that's pretty insane, right? It, re it doesn't write, read like a, a Wikipedia article. It doesn't read like a forum post. But in the same way, it gets even less like a, or like that if you push it to the set of space that you want. It's why one of the few pieces of prompting advice I definitely give people is give this a context. Tell the AI who it is. You're not doing that to make the AI into that person for real. It doesn't turn into Warren Buffett, but it does put it into the space where it's, it knows what the audience is and is speaking in a style that you don't get elsewhere. Yeah, and one of the things that I'm really excited about is uh, the, the ability to look into liminal spaces that we simply don't have as humans, right? The ability to kind of like analyze quickly hundreds of millions of vectors and for example, one of our projects is we're going to feed every written uh, story that we have access to uh, all the way back to, um, you know, Sanskrit, et cetera, and, and, and say, okay, t tell us about ourselves. Uh, and what other kind of projects like that are, are you thinking about in terms of what we can do going forward? I mean, so that's actually something I've been playing with a bit uh, as well. There are these well-known indices of fairy tales that have been kind of created based on various arcs, right? So 343, uh, the Arno something index, right? 343A is like, you know, uh, the princess eaten by a bear with the teacups or whatever. And, you know, Trost's culture, there's a really nice econ story showing that the kind of stories we tell shape the kinds of, uh, you know, how we approach entrepreneurship, but stories where tricksters are punished. Where societies where that's common, there's less entrepreneurship. So I think fundamental, really interesting insights about humanity from body connections is amazing, right? Another thing I did just for fun was I fed into um, GPT with Code Interpreter. There's a famous passage from the Iliad, um, which is the catalog of ships, which is just this list of all the locations. And I said, just map these for me, right? And, you know, there's been some very big projects, UVA and stuff to do this. And, well, you know, Obviously, you know, it actually was able to create an interactive map with me for the first, you know, 50 or 60 ship locations and find modern equivalents. I'm sure there were errors in it, but the idea that as a scholar, I could get that kind of progress. I mean, I, you know, I fed it my own books and I've been asking questions of it. Like you, this idea of working with the sort of mass knowledge of humanity and discovering new things, I think we're in for a golden era of sort of, you know, literary social science studies. And the other thing that's really cool about this is it takes some of the, like, 
there has been a long problem, you know, some people problem, some people advantage in academia, where I'm an academic, where everything's become quantified, right? I do quantitative research myself, but like everything has become very quantitative, which, you know, there's a lot of people who don't do quantitative research, do qualitative research, who have been kind of left out of this, like, well, we need precise effects and we can argue whether economics actually does what it's supposed to do on the tin or whatever else. But what's cool about this is you don't need to be technical anymore. You can literally ask questions with this. Like, give me, you know, I was shocked that I was able to ask the AI, tell me, show me five metaphors from my book. Because metaphor something is really hard to nail down, right? Because it doesn't use like or as, you know, as there's no clear indicators, not a simile. It was able to find metaphors. Like there's something very deep about its ability to understand human language that will let us do some pretty extraordinary things. Yeah. Um, and I, I am doing a similar project. I uh, was a, I am a journal keeper. I've kept journals for 42 years. And like, we're going to transcribe them all because they're all handwritten. And, uh, we'll feed them in. And my joke is I, I, I want the AI to explain myself to me. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I, I've spoken to somebody who's already doing this, who is, um, you know, and, and, who, you know, deep into AI stuff who basically they send, you know, they're sent, they have the, you know, GB 3.5 train up or they train up their own system and, uh, and create the embeddings in their own work. And then literally send the models to each other to look for points of agreement and disagreement in in that sort of, you know, vector space. So I think there's really interesting things we're going to learn about people as a result. You know, I think that there's, you know, there's this sort of transhumanist utopia dream of like, oh, we'll live together through the A, you know, forever through a, you know, AI uploading our brains. You know, I certainly don't have a strong thought that that is absolutely going to be true. But there is something very interesting about being able to query your own knowledge or somebody else's knowledge in a deeper way than we were able to before. Yeah. And I, I also love the idea of, uh, I've also written four books and, and I would love to feed all of those in, uh, they're all market oriented, uh, investing books, uh, but, uh, and then contrast and compare, right? Like what, what did I get wrong? Uh, what can I learn from, you know, people who are non quants? I think there's a ton of information there that, you know, would have just seemed too arduous uh, in a non AI environment that now is just like, it's like, I'm feel like a kid in a candy store and, and you must as well, given the amount of research you've done. Yeah. I mean, the transition, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, right? Like you start to relate to books very differently and st- stores of knowledge very differently. Right. And, you know, and also the way people can relate to my books is different. Like I, I've now been doing things like pasting in a chapter in my book and asking some questions to turn them into exercises, you know, read this chapter on how to generate ideas and then um, walk someone through the process of doing that. I send people a link now to my idea. You know, they can just use my book to generate ideas. Um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, which I, and that kind of leads me to another thing you've observed that I agree with in terms of early adopters are going to gain some pretty radical advantages to to people who you know the 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 later adopter tends to want something that's shrink-wrapped, easy to use, you know, kind of like the iPhone, I guess, right? You can take these out of the box and you can use them immediately. And pretty much you could when they launched it too. Um, What do you see happening with those later adopters? Do you think that, um, you know, we're going to see a a series of, I guess, what we call products Um, or, or, or no? So, I mean, I think that we're going to see that we're speed running the adoption curve, right? Partially because, you know, look, you think about the fastest adopting technologies, they're always, you know, they're like, you know, one of the categories is always letting students cheat on tests is always like, if there's a way of doing that, students will figure out a way to do it, right? Um, and so, you know, I think in the same way, the productivity gains are so potentially large that it potentially leapfrogs our normal problems, right? So, and again, because this is being integrated into Word and Google Docs, and you're going to have that little blanking, blanking cursor saying, what do you want to write about? Uh, I think we're going to see a speed run that we don't usually see in these cases. That doesn't mean people will be using at least their full capabilities, right? Most people are satisfied saying doing just enough with it. But, um, you know, I think we're going to see it like integrated into products in that fairly deep way. Uh, it also makes sense that like, you know, look, I can't wait to have a fully working, you know, true AI assistant. There's nothing more frustrating now than going back to Siri after using Bing, right? Where it's like, you know, I could say to Bing, like, hey, I want tacos tonight. I don't want to go. I'm going to be tired. So I don't want to go more than a couple hours. It can't be that crowded. 
And I want to make sure that there's vegetarian options available and make it something that's kind of fun, you know, fun environment maybe. And like tell, you know, and it will find something, right? If I tell that to any Syria, it'll be like, you said cheese. And, you know, <laughs> and like it's it's useless, right? So I do think that there's going to be this sort of ubiquitous assistant thing that's going to be really interesting too. So I don't know, like because this was chat first, like when I'm trying to create applications with the API, I kind of end up feeling like I should just take this away, and go back to chat, because that feels like the much more, you know, or at the very least, sort of the API playground, right? Like, why am I bothering with these other methods? Because just drink raw right from the fire hose. Yeah, um, and and that kind of leads to the idea about you know curiosity. I keep coming back to the idea that you know really curious people are the ones who really are just all in kind of on AI, like you. And, and I just wonder, can you, can you teach curiosity? So it, so there's a specific part of concept actually called the specific curiosity. That is that idea that like, it's always been tied with actually coming up with ideas, right? So curiosity is not always the same creativity, but it ends up being creative because the active searching for answers, right? If you're the kind of person who can't let, you know, can't let something go by without Googling it, right? And like, can't, you know, want to know how, wants to know how something works then you're always generating hypotheses in your head and testing them. And that helps you come up with ideas. Some people are, you know, people are curious about different things. It's very rare for people to not be curious about anything, but they might be curious about their hobby or about their, you know, a sport they follow, or they might be curious about an activity that they do. Right. And so I think that that's where this opens things up as people start to view this. I think that as an early adopter, it's for me less curiosity than, you know, I have a lot of ideas and every time I've had to implement ideas before now, I've had to do something really annoying, like start a whole company to do it or raise grant money, or start a research project. And I've done that a lot, and it all it's so much more. Like, there's, you've got a team, and you've got, like, I love my teams. They're amazing, and they're much smarter than me, and they do great work. But, like, it's a lot to make the world change. And now I'm like, huh, I wonder if AI could do this. And the answer is usually yes. Like, I'm like, I wonder what would happen if, you know, if we, if I took the Bayo tapestry and it has to create realistic photos. Let's do that. It takes two seconds. These would have been passing in thoughts before. And that's where I want more people to be, is like, you know, like I, I think about like our handyman who helped us do some renovations of the house, just an absolute genius at, you know, and woodworking and, you know, master carpenter. And I just think about the stuff he would do with a multimodal AI where you could take a picture of stuff and be like, hey, how would this look this way? Like what other beam should I use? Like, I think there's, there's everyone, like, there's, there's tons of depth of expertise. And I think we need to broaden access to that because general curiosity is hard and I don't even know if it's that valuable, right? I'm an academic. Um, but it is, but specific curiosity can be very powerful. Yeah, I agree. I was talking with uh, our uh, interior designer and I said, to, and she, she was, she's kind of like, uh, oh, I don't, I don't want to know about this AI. And I'm like, maybe you do, because wouldn't you like, if you could just dictate, this is the couch that I want to see. And then you could just throw it right onto the, uh, in 3D uh, and Mott, and she's like, that could happen. I went, oh, absolutely, that could happen. And suddenly she was like, okay, now I'm very, very interested. So I love your idea that, you know, there's so many different people who have very specific and deep domain knowledge on things that might not naturally like, like say, oh, I wonder if I could do this. But the minute they hear it, they're like, oh, wow, I could definitely, definitely do that. Absolutely. And the whole idea of this, like, it's so funny is the tool diffuse faster than how to use it, right? So like, you know, um, I, there's just categories of stuff where it just clearly dominates where normal people would, you know, where you normally do other kinds of work. I was thinking about, you know, my dad had, uh, he has, you know, hearing aids that connect to his iPhone and we wanted it. So it muted the iPhone, you know, it, it, it only took in voice calls, but not music as a result. And, you know, I did the usual thing to do this search. I did a Google search and I'm hoping someone on Reddit had the exact same problem, but they, they didn't, right? And then you had 400 product forums that are not clear. And, but I just asked Bing, like, how do I solve this problem? And it, it, even though there was no direct answer on the internet, I was able to extrapolate from all of the materials and the marketing material and gave me the exact right feature to solve the problem. I could find a button and told me where I was, right? Like there's categories of stuff that when you start to use it, you're like, oh, this is just superior. And your story reminds me of another thing, which is trying to emphasize to people like this is already here, right? I think too many people are thinking about this as like it's blockchain, it's you know NFTs. Like four years from the nerds are all into it, and it'll probably it'll probably die out. But if it doesn't, I'll worry about it in five years. And the thing I keep trying to tell executives is like, no, no, it's here now. Ten percent of your employees are doing ninety percent of their work with AI. 
and they're just hanging out. And you figure this out or you don't. Uh, this is not a long-term wait. Yeah. And you, you've made the point that we're certainly seeing, uh, which is th- this is unusual in that if individuals who are like embracing this, corp- at the corporate level, we're not seeing that quite yet. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that. And, you know, for example, w- one of our uh, uh, use cases for open source AI is that ultimately corporations that are going to want to use it are going to have to have access to every line of code that their cybersecurity people can sign off on, and they're not going to be willing to use a black box, right? Uh, Whereas individuals, like you saw what happened with Samsung, where they uh, were using it, and then suddenly their code got out of the wild. But, but But it didn't. It didn't, though, right? Like that ended up being like, the problem is like, this is all being done by rumors. But the actual Samsung story was that they got worried because people were typing Samsung secrets into AI. It never produced the content as far as, I mean, I spent a bunch of time trying to track this down. It's all rumors, right? Like people use tools all the time. They don't have the code for what's going on here. Like people are sending stuff to AWS constantly to have AWS do stuff that they don't quite know what it is. Like the idea that you're not going to do this to Azure or to open it, like it's not true. Like this is what happens when you, when things run on rumor, right? And like, you know, OpenAI finally has a security site up. You're going to read all the certificates now. Like, it is 100% rumor. Like, AI is, you know, sucking down your company's secrets. And, like, that's not actually that big a problem. First, to the extent that it is, it's happening in the reinforcement learning thing. There's a whole bunch of privacy options. There'll be even more in a month. You, lawyers are creating all kinds of problems here for stopping stuff because they don't, and it'd be okay if they stopped it knowing what the problem was. But, and then the other problem is IT departments, when they get their hands on this end up, you know, sort of viewing as a bad IT solution. It's not those things. And so I, I actually push back on that. Like the Samsung thing, it's amazing. Or that lawyer, you know, there's a story all over the news a couple of days ago about this lawyer yeah. who was sending off. Like, that's also like, obviously this lawyer was being lazy and dumb. Like, it's not even like defending the idea that like, this is not something you would do in legal terms. But obviously, if you're a good lawyer, you can get a lot of help. And I talk to lawyers all the time. We're using AI for all kinds of purposes. You just need to know when to use it. Yeah. And th- that's a really interesting observation. Uh, why, why do you think that is it? Is it fear of the new? Why do you think that there's so many of these rumors, especially at the corporate level, um, in, in terms of you know, just a, a fear of, of the unknown? Well, what do you think is going on there? So I, I think that partially this is because this launched so suddenly and there's no, there's no, everyone is used to IT rolling out from the position of like, hey, I, have to make a decision about which ERP solution I want to buy. And there's a bunch of material to buy. There's people to talk to. There's well-defined APIs, you know, and it cost them, and no competitor could get me because I, I'm i adopting in the next three years that we have to retrain everybody and it's going to cost $8 million. We'll hire, we'll hire you know, Accenture to do it. it there's a, there is a way the world has worked for building technology that is the exact opposite of how this thing is working. So people are just, their analogies are messed up. They're thinking of this as like, there's no one to call to adopt this. I mean, look, Microsoft will be happy to give you Azure servers or whatever to, you know, but like, there's no one to talk to. You can't call McKinsey and they're not going to be able to help you. Like, they'll try, they're smart people, but why would their skills be better than the skills of your, you know? And so one of the things I keep trying to emphasize to executives is the people who know how to use this are already working at your company who will make your company successful. So your question to them is, are they going to tell you? And if they're worried that your first education is, I have 30% performance improvement, we're going to fire 30% of workers, then no one's going to ever tell you anything. So you have to build the system around the idea that you people need to feel free, like that this is going to only help them when they tell you that they're secretly doing 90% of their work through AI. Yeah. And, you know, that that is like, a, I mean, that could be an entire podcast in itself, that the, this idea of the the old models are collapsing. And there is not yet sort of the, uh, as you point out, you can't go to McKinsey and say, okay, fix this for us, right? right. <laughs> because they, they don't know either. And I completely align on this idea that you've got to create a different environment because you're right. I know lots of people in big companies who I talk to quite a bit and they are killing it with AI. And I'm like, have you, have you, uh, like, socialize that and and like some of them i i would look at me and i'd be like are you fucking kidding me no <laughs> right exactly why why would you what a terrible exactly. idea 
Exactly. <laughs> and, and that kind right? of like said. all the advantage goes away instantaneously. Yeah. When you socialize it. And, you know, I think that that's kind of a fascinating to watch it unfold. Uh, I think you're right, though, that, you know, we've got to get uh, a, an environment where we do get those people to say, OK, yeah, I will step up. I will show you how this could be helpful for us as a, as a company. Right. And then it required a C-level executive to, under, to make a commitment in advance to the idea that they're using this to advance the company rather than to do the things C-level executives tend to do when they get a new technology, which is cost cutting. Right. And that isn't easy. But I think that, you know, again, golden time for startups. Right. I just got three or four free employees. Yeah. And uh, uh, absolutely golden time for startups. I think it's an absolutely fascinating time. Well, I am very mindful that you have been very generous with uh, starting early for me. I know you have an engagement uh, to go to afterwards. You're a very busy uh, guy. Uh, this has been Absolutely fascinating. I would love to have you back because I only touched on like half of the questions after reading all of your stuff that I wanted to ask you about. But one of the things that we do here is um, at, at, at the end, we, we make you the emperor of the world, but just for a day. Um, you can't put anyone in a re-education camp and you can't kill anybody. What's, what's the but point? You, but, but, but you can. <laughs> but you can. Incept, we're going to give you a magic microphone and you can speak two things into it and incept all 8 billion people on the planet. They're going to wake up whenever their morning is and they're going to think, hey, you know, I just had these two great ideas and I'm going to act on both of them. What, what, what are you going to incept, Ethan? All right. So, so a general piece and a specific piece. So I think, and they're both related. So I think the message I want to get across is agency. We have decision-making and choice. We have decision-making choice in this AI world about what this means. What does it mean to have this you know, human-ish intelligence involved in our lives? And we get to decide what that is, right? This is not something being done to us. We get to make decisions about what this is. And we should actively make those decisions. We shouldn't passively sit back. And that relates to the second point, which is you have agency over your life to a large degree too. Stuff happens to everybody. There's a lot of luck involved, but there is a lot of opportunity now to, especially with the world of AI, to access resources you couldn't access before, to try and make a dream come true, you know, get that education you wanted to get, try it, building something you couldn't build before. No one's guaranteeing you success, but there's never been a better time to do that. And I would kind of urge people to like, this is a great time to kind of shake off the, the spores of habit and look around and say, what do I want to do differently? Because I have more tools to do that now than I ever did before. Oh, amen. I love both of those. Agency is a, is a wonderful thing. Well, listen, thank you so much for coming on Infinite Loops. Uh, I uh, really appreciate your time. I love your work and keep going. Thank you. This was a really fascinating conversation.